Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Today we are going to continue our exploration of some of the major transits of the week, which we started unpacking yesterday. We sort of took a look at all of the transits in total for the week, and now we're going to start looking at them one by one. One of the transits that is happening right now that will also uh, be a part of Another major transit in the week is Venus's trine with Neptune, which then leads seamlessly into Venus's opposition with Pluto. That sequence is something we're going to now unpack one step at a time today, looking at Venus's trine with Neptune from Cancer to Pisces. I have five things to watch for given this combination, which you should notice, or it'll show up a little bit uh, in the next day or two. So we'll look at the timeline. We'll unpack some of the details of this archetypal combination. Hopefully you find this useful. Before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, share your comments too. We love hearing from you all. It helps the channel to grow when you like and subscribe. It takes two seconds. We really appreciate it. Transcripts of any of my daily talks can be found on the website, nightlightastrology.com, where I want to promote some cool things we have coming up, including speaker series. If you go to the speaker series under events, you're going to see three free talks that you can register for, including a talk by T. Susan Chang on the Deccans and their connection to the tarot, which is a really cool topic. She's actually written a very well-known book about. And then we have Erica Beach giving a talk on Sedna and Jeannie Frischa giving a talk on the intersection between uh, artists, their art, and their birth charts, which should be really interesting if you are into art especially. But a lot to learn in all of these talks. They're free. If you can't attend live, you get the recording afterward. Go to the events page, click on live talks, and you'll see my next one coming up is Uranus and Gemini, Chaos, Mind, and Magic. This is an exploration of the archetypal significance of Uranus and Gemini, which will be taking place, getting started next year. So we've been previewing some of the big outer planetary ingresses of 2025 this year in my webinar series. We started with Neptune and Aries. We're going to look at Uranus and Gemini. At some point, we're going to look at Saturn and Aries as well. But anyway, Uranus and Gemini should be a really interesting uh, talk to get us prepped for that transit next year. That's July 18th, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern. When you register, you'll get the link to attend live. And if you cannot attend live, you get the recording again later. So uh, we give you the link after the talk is over. All right, so a few things there coming up. Hope that you'll be able to join us. Now let's turn our attention to the real-time clock where we are going to track Venus's movement into the trine with Neptune. All right, so here we go. Let's get the arrow out. And you can see Tuesday, July 9th, we have Venus moving within that three degree range of a trine to Neptune in Pisces. Neptune and Saturn are both retrograde now, by the way. Uh, it won't have a huge impact on how we discuss it today. But Wednesday, July 10th, we'll see Venus in within one degree. And then we see the exact trine on Thursday, July 11th. The exact trine between these two planets is taking place, this is about 9.30 a.m. Central Time, July 11th, but you should be feeling this energy building today, tomorrow, Thursday, and then by Friday, Venus starts opposing Pluto, and instantly we're into a totally different dynamic because Venus is shifting into a fixed fire sign. Everything changes. Uh, so when, when Venus moves across the sign boundary, there's a disengagement with the trine to Neptune because the whole signs are no longer configured. And then we go right into the opposition with Pluto. So we will be exploring the Venus opposition to Pluto uh, as the week goes on, just like we're going to take a look at Venus's trine to Neptune today. All right, so there are five things to watch for. In my opinion, these are some of the most interesting archetypal dynamics that I could think of. I spend a little time thinking about the fact that Venus is in Cancer and that Neptune is in Pisces with this list in particular, but these are also general Venus-Neptune combinations, especially when the two planets are trying to one another, which means they have a very smooth and uh, generally like harmonious way of relating. So um, <clears throat> now what I want to do is, um, whoops. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I had some things popping up. All right, so five things to watch for. And I hope that these, the thing is, is that one of these themes may become really important for you or several of them. Uh, or it's possible that there's another way of conceptualizing the connection between Venus and Neptune. It's not even on our list because archetypes are like jewels. And when you combine them, it's, there's so many different ways of turning the jewel. 
and the light bounces off and reflects different images, archetypally speaking. So this is just something to wet your whistle. Number one, receiving what we need and giving freely what is needed. This is when you're in water signs, water is naturally connective. Think about streams of water running down a hill and pooling together. So water has a natural way of wanting to connect and wanting to attach and bond and wanting to pool and run together. And so when you have Venus, the goddess of love and relationships in Cancer, uh, a water sign, and Neptune in Pisces, a water sign, and they're pooling together through the connection of a trine, which tends to be, it's of the nature of Jupiter, trines are, and they tend to bring a sense of collectivity, unity, and connection. Then you have this great indication in the sky of relational connectivity, of things, of resources, of emotions, of thoughts, of feelings, of bodies, of desires, pooling together or running together. And so there is a natural way in which a transit like this is able to be receptive to the needs of others and to give freely what is needed. It's just easier when these two planets connect in a trine to say, I see you, I feel you, I rec I intuit your needs, you know, I feel, or you, you, or your needs are being very clearly articulated and I can address them and I can give to them. And also it makes it much easier to be in a receptive position to receive what we need. So this, the, the give and take of two of Venus, Neptune in a trine in water is just wonderful when it comes to um, loving and being loved, giving and receiving the pooling together of needs and feelings and desires. Uh, there's just such a nice fluid interaction right now that can build a sense of cohesiveness emotionally within our relationships. So watch for that. Watch for that smooth connectivity of giving and receiving. Number two, there is a way in which this kind of connection can be a, a picture of healing where there are relational wounds, especially now Venus and cancer could be family wounds. It could be friendship wounds. It could be the wounds that you have in love and marriage and relationships, but it's also wounds that may have a collective dimension. Your wound is part of the story of what women experience as um, uh, many women experience as a wound or your experience is one of, uh, let's say you grew up in an alcoholic family. One of the healing, when you go through layer, you're pulling back layers of the onion and you're going through healing experiences throughout the course of your lifetime and you grew up with, say, abu uh, substance abuse in your family, there's a way in which you, as you're healing, you feel that you're connected to a process of healing that many other people and in, in families of similar backgrounds have gone through. So the ancestral dimension and the collective dimension are very much a part of what could be a healing moment with these two planets trining one another. Cancer refers to the deep pool of ancestral, uh, racial, cultural, historical memory. The moon's sign is a sign of reflections in the water. And reflections are memories. Reflections are not the original event, but the stored trauma of the event or the stored joy or bliss of the event, the nostalgia for a time that you're no longer connected to, but wish you were. All of that is sort of pooled together in the watery lunar sign of cancer. Venus in cancer, trining Neptune in Pisces can be healing insofar as it addresses the collective and familial ancestral historical dimensions of various hurts. And the reason that it's able to address those things and provide healing is, again, because you have two planets in Venus and Neptune that are compassionate, sensitive, kind, healing, harmonious, coming together through this element of water to heal. Uh, water is one of the things that we give to people most quickly when they're suffering, right? It's like drink water or wash the wound with water. Uh, water heals, water purifies, water cleanses. Water shifts your mood. I mean, I can't tell you how many times my kids are, they're playing outside and it's hot out and there's things start melting down. It's like, let's take a break. Let's drink a little water, you know, <laughs> simple. Number three, the need for mothering in love. I think that we have some really backwards ideas about nurturance. One of them that I see people 
in astrological counseling dealing with over and over again is this feeling that once you've become an adult, you're no longer in need of parenting. And especially there is no acceptable way in which your spouse or lover uh, should play the role of parent. And on one level, like that's intuitive, right? We go, yeah, like I'm married to someone or I'm in love with someone. They're not my mom. They're not my dad. However, all of us have an inner child. All of us have parents on the inner committees. You know, some of them are not very nice. You know, some of them need to adjust the way that they parent internal. Like, you know, some of us need better internal parental figures in our psyches. Some of us uh, uh, have great inner mentors and parents, whatever. But the point is that part of how we always care for the inner child has to do with not only our, the quality of our, our own parental voices within, the, the parental dimension of us, whether we're literal parents or not, is a part of life. But part of how we develop that and actualize it is also to receive that voice and presence of parenting from other human beings, not just our literal parents. And so there are going to be <clears throat> times when, you know, my wife just needs to lay her head in my lap and I, I play with her hair or give her a back rub. She just needs a hug. And there's going to be times when I need that. And it's a kind of soothing, it's, it feels like there's a little mothering going on. And I, I, I'm guessing most of you have no issue with this, but you would not believe how many people are, they come into um, astrological counseling sessions thinking about meeting someone and they're, there's a lot of fear and anxiety. Like I should have all of my needs perfectly squared away. There should be no part of me that is still a child in need of reassurance or nurturance or care or devotion or tenderness. Things that lovers maybe shouldn't be primarily, but it is like, I always want to tell people like, it is okay to not be fully actualized <laughs> you know, as an adult, that, that there's, that the child always remains a part of us. And any relationship that you have, whether it's a friend or a lover or anything, should be able to tap into a parental dimension where you can care for, nurture. We have to parent each other throughout life. We have to parent ourselves. But there's no hard boundary that says you have, once you graduate from the karmic curriculum of your family and you've gone off to a liberal arts college, you know, from that moment on, you shall only ever be able to access the parental dimension of, of life through yourself, you know, and it could be regressive to, you know, or needy to require too much of someone. And there's the need to develop, uh, maybe secure, uh, attachment patterns in love as this is part of the pop. You know, this is a big theory right now. Attachment theory. It's like, yeah, but we don't uh, develop a secure attachment unless we're also in relationships with people who contribute to the feeling of security. That's a parental mothering quality that, you know, again, we need in friendships, we need in love relationships, we need to be able to give that to people at times. We know how to tap into that. We also need to know, you know, when it's too much or uh, when someone else needs to parent themselves or, or what have you. But there is a need for parenting or mothering in love. And the point is that this is a transit that can highlight or accent the need to connect with that energy. Number four is romance, imagination, and memory. If our relationships, there's a great quote from James Hillman, and I'm going, I'm going to actually, why don't I just pull it up? I was thinking I'd be able to remember it, but I, I'm guessing I can't. So, so he says, um, <clears throat> Without imagination, where is it? Love alone is not enough. Without imagination, love stales into sentiment, duty, boredom. Relationships fail not because we've stopped loving, but, but because we first stopped imagining. Love alone is not enough. Without imagination, love stales into sentiment, duty, and boredom. Relationships fail not because we've stopped loving, but because we first stopped imagining. I love that quote. And this is a great transit for us to kind of pause and connect with imagination, romance, 
even memory. Um, memory is very romantic. If you, when my girls, one of the things they love to do, they love to pick up an album that we have of like three years worth of their baby, like little toddler kind of baby pictures. They'll say, will you look at this with me? And I sit down and I turn the page and I look and I go, oh, look at how you were so cute. I used to rest. I used to take naps with you right on my chest. Oh, I loved how it felt, you know, and they, they just, their cups get filled by looking backward in time and remembering and appreciating and entering into the imagination of a previous time of a previous world. That is so romantic. Have you ever just sat down with someone you loved and talked about the things you've done? the good times you've had, there is a need to appreciate where we've been, how we got to where we are. It's like a blues song or a poem, you know, or it's a movie that you love. We also need to project forward into the future with imagination. What could we become? What could we do? How could we do it together? We need to have imaginative ways of connecting with one another that enhance and deepen our emotional bonds backward and forward in time. Venus, Neptune, and water signs, so good at this, right? This is such a sweet, romantic, imaginative, maybe nostalgic way of looking at things. As long as we don't get caught up in that sense of eh, something's not right, it wasn't good, it could be better, you know, that kind of angstiness can accompany a transit like this. Don't get caught in the angst so much as the appreciation, the sentimental qualities that are lighter and sweeter, you know? Well, Number five is a clearing, a gentle rain, or a swift deluge. Venus, Neptune, and water signs can come like a sudden downpour of emotion. Now, that emotion may be very cleansing, very helpful. It may unify and, and heal and soothe, but it can come like a flood. There can be a flooding or an overwhelm of emotional qualities in relationships. Constructive, but, you know, when it rains, it pours. So be ready for maybe a swift current of emotional energy to come through and be very overpowering. But in a trine, you're thinking mostly of this being pretty smooth. So you now sometimes water comes, it grows, it's big, it does something. Um, and this, this connection, uh, I, I want to remind people of that because, you know, could be a little overwhelming on the level of the water. Uh, a gentle rain, though, on the other hand, Venus trying Neptune, it's like a gentle rain comes down and just washes the debris away, cleanses, clears, heals. So think about that with gentle, gentle rain coming down and maybe a little subtler than, I mean, it's when you're looking at things like this in an archetypal vacuum, it's easy to then go and feel like the, the transit underperforms compared to your expectations. The trick is to use these to amplify your ability to see something that still may be a little subtle. It may be a little bit more in the background. It depends on where it's hitting in your chart usually. But just watch for that gentle rain as a metaphor, a clearing, a healing, a purifying, a washing away, a surrendering, a dissolving, a, on, and also the dreaming, the romance, the imagination, the need for mothering and love, the healing of relational wounds with collective or family dimensions, receiving what we need and giving freely what is needed. Those were my thoughts for this transit. I hope that you have a nice, smooth, beautiful, watery uh, couple of days, and then we're going to turn right into Venus in a fire sign opposing Pluto. <laughs> it's just like, so we're also going to talk about how does that connection work? Why are the two so intimately, so closely connected? What might the connection be about as much as what will Venus opposing Pluto be about? So we'll do that as the week goes on. All right, that's it for today. I hope you're having a great day. We'll see you again soon. Bye.